All right, fun times. Um, so without slides, this is going to be really kind of interesting to explain, but we're going to do it anyway. Um, I have no idea what my computer is doing. Um, so my name is Jim Palmer. Um, I'm a Wi-Fi guy at Ruckus. I also have an Oreo cookie and a pillow. Um, but I, today we're going to talk about MLO and uh, punctured transmission. Um, so just have to pay attention to me without slides. Um, MLO is if this is going to be kind of a repeat of what was ha or what I did in Prague. So if you saw that presentation in Prague, um, you can go back and you can watch some of this. Um, we're going to, yeah, I'm going to keep talking. Um, MLO, if you don't remember, I'm going to do a real quick refresh. Right now, it's still a two radio to two radio. Um, so you get, we always have two radios in the APs. Our client devices will have two radios. That's kind of a given. Here we go. Um, you have these two devices. We're, we're trying to solve uh, really three problems with link uh, redundancy, link aggregation, and link selection. What happens is you have link one, link two, multi-link. Um, there's a lot of technology and terminology that goes along in this. If you're a big fan of the initialisms and all that stuff, you can go look at this. Um, it, it's in the actual beacon frame where you can see MLO turned on in the different modes that it supports. And the, the four modes that we're going to go through very quickly. The biggest thing I want to point out to you is how do you tell the difference? There's really only two that you need to pay attention to. One of them is the multi-link multi-radio, and there's two different versions of that the multi-link single radio. There's really, even though there is two, it's really just one. It's just how it sets up that second radio. And we'll take a look at that here. Biggest thing I need to uh, sort of emphasize is not all chipsets from the devices and the, from the APs and the clients will support all the modes. And it's, as with everything for MLO and punctured transmission, this is, or at least MLO, this is driven by the client. I can offer it from an AP, I can set it up, I can configure it, but it's still up to the uh, client device to actually trigger and use it. Um, so asynchronous, multi-link, multi-radio, there's a couple, there's two things I want to emphasize here. The, each one depends, all right, it contends for the channel access independently from each other. So even though there's two radios, 2.45 or 6, 6.5, however it's configured, they contend for the channel independently from each other, which requires filtering and isolation between the two bands to keep them from can, um, interfering with each other. And what it looks like in operation is it will send on one band and then come back on the other. And, and it'll, it can do that independently from each other. And that's, where, that's why we need that isolation, which requires some extra hardware and stuff inside the client, so it's a little expensive. With synchronous multi-link multi-radio, it relies on contended, or the contention is coordinated between. So both of them have to get access at the same time. Tell me what's wrong with that. Uh, we don't need the filtering, but because you have that coordinated access, but you read really clean RF, and it's super complex, so how often do you think this is going to happen? This is something like what, if you've ever done a back-to-back point-to-point link, you know, where you put one point in the other way, and it has to coordinate when it's sending that transmit frame so it doesn't interfere with each other. And so because of the channel access and contending for it and being coordinated, probably not going to see this one. The next one uh, is... Multi-link single radio, just a standard one. Uh, this is almost what we have today. But what happens though, what the, the one difference is when the client device associates, it actually associates on both the bands so it has a configured data path. So when it switches from one radio to the other, it doesn't have to do the four-way handshake because it's already done. It already has an, this MLD Mac that's on the device, it's on the AP, it's registered, so it can just simply switch back and forth. However, um, it's also known as a power save mode and because the reason why that is, is because it turns off that other radio. And so you'll have that link one that's going. Now the AP keeps his radio on because well, that's what APs do. And so all what the client does is it just turns the radio off and then it turns the other one on and switches back over. So that way it doesn't have two radios on at the same time drawing power. If you watch, what happens on that, on that multi-link device A is the radio turns off and then it turns on and then it turns, and it, so it switches back and forth like that, which is pretty much what we have today when a client device will go from one band to the other. Now, the one that um, 
is more likely to be seen than we've seen the most of is the enhanced multi-link single radio. This one, it listens on both bands at the same time. So we have our two radios. And so what you'll notice is while it's the information and links going on on link one, link two, the radio stays on. So it's listening, it knows what's happening. So if it needs to switch, it can automatically switch because it's already there, it's already working. So the client device knows what's happening on the other band when it's doing this. So what happens when you get this running and you see when we introduce contention and we had to do this artificially into the six gigahertz band. Some people have been talking about this, like trying to get your client to roam. Uh, Jerry was talking about that, about, you know, if you have a nice clean 80 meg, 160 meg channel on six gigahertz, why would you ever go to five? Well, we had to artificially force it. And now what you'll see is this is a packets per second. Um, and I have to thank uh, a gentleman here by the name of Peter Corey. Um, he helped me get all this stuff. But what happens is when you introduce that, uh, can, that interference in the six gigahertz band, it immediately switches over. It's still sending, it's still listening on that other band to find out when it's ready to go back and it switches. Um, in the uplink, kind of the same thing, but our client devices are not as great as our AP. So the uplink, you have that same type of experience, but you know, it kind of bounces back and forth. It's not as steady. Now what happens is when you look at the throughput, with interference, you can see the upload and it's bouncing from you know, a low of 88 megabits per second up to almost 600 megabits per second. Um, on the downlink, you're seeing to say it's not as bad because again, the APs are better, but when we turn on MLO and you take a look at what the result is, you're looking at a constant 250 megabits per second. And I wanna highlight something here on the upload. When you look at the time frame. This is a five minute test of running at a constant flat 250 megabits per second for five minutes, even with all the interference. Um, so when you compare those two, you can definitely see the difference. We get the reliability and, and predictable performance that we're really looking for. Latency, this is a big one. Um, when we look at these, um, these graphs, what we're measuring at is the 99th percentile. So 99% of all of our, all the data we collected is going to fall into what I'm about to show you. Without MLO, the latency is 58 milliseconds on the uplink. On the downlink, it's 483 milliseconds at the 99th percentile. When we turn that on, it switches and we get a little bit better. On the uplink, 19 times improvement. On the downlink, or, and that's, so we went from 58 milliseconds to three milliseconds of latency. On the downlink, a 22 times improvement. What we're seeing is we went from 483 milliseconds to 22 milliseconds of latency by turning NMLO on, allowing those client devices, when it has that interference, when things aren't good, to switch back and forth. It can now do what it needs to do. So, let's see. I think I get through the rest of this in about four minutes, Peter. So, punctured transmission. Um, when I looked into this, it turns out there's preamble puncturing and there's uh, punctured transmission. And while officially it's preamble puncturing, that always confused me, but punctured transmission is actually also kind of referred to in, as, a, as a synonymous thing. So whichever one you use, you're not gonna be too bad, um, but officially it is a preamble puncture. So it's optional, in, well it was optional, is optional in Wi-Fi 6, but it's required in Wi-Fi 7. And what we're doing is we're carving out a portion of the spectrum or the channel that is being interfered with. Now there is plenty of marketing that goes along with this, as you probably all know. And up until yesterday, I was partially responsible for this, so my bad, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but I'm, I'm now here to put a little bit of a critical thinking into what we're actually talking about with punctured transmission or preamble puncturing. Um, what, it, what the marketing will tell you is it's a solution for all those pesky interferers and it preserves these super wide channels that we have. Now we get a slight degradation of throughput because, well, we're knocking out some of the spectrum we can use. Did we tell you that it's a mandated solution? And this is a fantastic improvement. And, and think of all the children, I mean the throughput that we're saving by doing this, right? Fantastic marketing stuff. Now the critical thinking is this works in 20 megahertz wide segments, right? Now this is critical because it works in all three bands. But at 2.4, 
Who's going to puncture a 20 megahertz channel out of your, out of your operating channels in 2.4? Any? OK, good. Um, at 5 gigahertz, I mean, I'm crazy and weird, and sometimes I'll run 80 megahertz channels in 5 gigahertz, but normally you're running 20s and 40s. So again, it's the same thing. We don't really gain anything. It works. I could demo it and show it, but what do you really gain? The other thing is, it works by static assignment. So you're not puncturing out, like just, oh, here's this random interference. We don't know what it is, but we're just gonna carve it out. No, it's a static assignment. You're puncturing a pattern. And so what happens is, is when you say I have, say, four bonded channels, and you wanna puncture a pattern, and you puncture the third one of those channels, if, you, if that channel were to move somewhere else because of a dynamic assignment, you've now punctured something else, and when somebody moves in, they don't have the puncture. So it's all done statically. So if you think about we're gonna do six gigahertz and we're gonna make you statically assign it and you're gonna have to go in and statically puncture it, but what are these pesky interferers in six gigahertz that we're trying to puncture out? I've asked that question a lot and no one's been able to give me an answer, so if you can, please come find me and give me the, give me the answer. So what does this actually mean when we look at it in operation? I might make it. Um, in a, in a, remember, we're talking about puncturing out a 20 megahertz wide uh, operation or channel. Now, in the past, when we would get some interference, it would automatically start breaking it down. And so if you had one in that you know, channel 48 in that fourth one, you go down to a 40. Now, if you had one down there, it would drop down to a 20. And so you can see it's like, what we're losing, well, what we're not gaining back in these, some of these cases is like this channel 44 there's no interference there, so why are we sort of giving that up? And so our bandwidth reduction is kind of inefficient. Um, so this is, this is really cool because in, with punctured transmission, when you have an 80 megahertz channel and you say, get some interference down there on channel 40, well, what happens is that you still have your 20 and then the 40 above is recovered. So now you're running at 75% of your operation. But again, it's like if you're not running 80s in 5 gigahertz and you're in 6 gigahertz and you have, I mean, I'm still waiting for these pesky interferers that I have to puncture out so I can make this all work. Um, but to show you what that looks like, I'm going to have Peter come up and we're going to do um, a little live demo. Um, I have a Wi-Fi 7, a Ruckus Wi-Fi 7 AP setup over here and we're going to do some puncturing on my on my AP, and of course it disconnected. So while Peter's getting set up, take my assistant, we'll take this. Do you need an adapter? You got it, okay. All right, so. I can't see you, Pete. Yeah, I'm not. I'm connected. Oh, there it goes. There it okay. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to <clears throat> run a speed test from my phone, and I'm not so much worried about the speed I'm getting. That's not what I wanna see. What I wanna see is the spectrum that we're being utilized. And so we're down there on channel five in that first 160. All right, so that's what it would look like. My AP will let me log in. And I was logged in until I went and actually tried to do this. Should we zoom in just on that bit of the spectrum? Yeah, we can do that. Well, if I can't get this thing to log in for me, um, we're doing a thing with, uh, with Phil uh, tomorrow night where we're going to demo this as long, along with um, MLO. Yeah, my AP stopped responding. So, 
Oh, well, it looks really cool. Um, we can light up the spectrum. Um, and, it, uh, and you can definitely see sort of that, you know, you get this, the, the nice little U shape that you'd expect to see. But again, it's like, what are we actually puncturing out? Because again, when, just when we look at here, and I mean, we see we have this one channel that's running, and the spikes are probably some probes or something, Peter. I mean, what do you think? I mean, and so, but again, w w what am I puncturing? This is just, I mean, we have a bunch of six gigahertz APs in here, and there's just, there's nothing to puncture. You know, so I mean, yeah, it's all Wi-Fi, but it's, it's like, but what am I trying to puncture? So if you have an environment where you're set it up, you've designed it, you've done all this stuff, and it's done right, what are you going to have to puncture? And if you go outdoors and you're doing standard power with AFC coordination, it's not like, I mean, you're going to be told what you're allowed to be on so you don't interfere. Again, I'm still looking for these pesky interferers that are, you know, that we're, we're saving the Wi-Fi world from with, <laughs> by doing punctured transmission. So, um, sorry my demo didn't work, um, but, uh, Okay, hold on a second. We'll do this off stage then. Yeah, he's still showing. Um, we'll go here. Okay. So, we saw the speed test before. No, yeah, just go, let's go back to that one. So I'm still connected. And we, we, well, we played this, we were doing this the other day, I realized I have to get a little bit farther away. So the puncture didn't work. I ran this for hours yesterday and I had no problems. So, makes sense. But um, <laughs> come tomorrow night and I'll show you how it, how it works with something different. So, thank you. Thanks, Peter. <laughs>